Committee today is in public session. Uh, we've received apologies today from Senator Coughlin for the first half of the meeting and then uh, also from uh, Deputy Colin Ann. Mobile phone notice, I would just like to remind members to ensure their mobile phones are switched off. Uh, this is important as it causes problems for the broadcasting, editorial and sound staff. Uh, today, I'm delighted we have engagement on alliance building to strengthen the European Union with uh, Angel Odunhu, the Director General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, and Trade Ambassador Mr. Joe Hackett, a Deputy Permanent Representative of Ireland to the EU. I would like to welcome Ambassador Hackett, a Deputy Permanent Representative, and Ms. Angel Odunhu, the Director General, uh, here today to discuss alliance building to strengthen the European Union. This joint committee remains convinced of the importance of ensuring that Ireland plays its full role within the EU at all levels, that we continue to develop our understanding of situations and priorities of other member states, and build strong coalitions. We ourselves have a visiting delegation from the Portuguese uh, Parliament later today. Uh, today's engagement is an important part of our consideration of alliances by looking at the government's overall strategy and, and approach, and what, look, what, what, and what uh, that looks like on the ground in Brussels. Before we begin, I wish to remind everyone of the rules on privilege. Members are reminded to the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or unofficially the by name or in such a way as to make them identifiable. By virtue of Section 72L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any persons or identity by, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. First of all, I might ask Director General Ms. Odunhu to make your opening statement, and then we'll follow on that uh, by uh, Ambassador Hackett. And I'm sure the committee members and myself uh, will have questions and comments for you both. And again, I wish, wish to welcome you and your delegation, and also welcome everyone that is here in the, in the gallery today. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank you and the committee, indeed, for the invitation. Uh, this is a really critical issue, the question of alliance building and building to strengthen the European Union. As you mentioned, I'm joined by Ambassador Joe Hackett, uh, Ireland's Deputy Permanent Representative to the EU, and then also by two colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs, Kira Delaney and Claire Callaghan. Working closely with a range of EU partners has always been important for Ireland, but as the committee itself has rightly pointed out, some of the changes occurring this year provide further impetus for this work. These include European Parliament elections in May, the appointment of a new commission, a new European Council president, national elections in a number of member states, the adoption of a new strategic agenda to guide the work of the Union, and of course Brexit. We are all well aware of the unprecedented challenge that Brexit poses to the European Union as a whole and to Ireland in particular. The solidarity shown by member states has been remarkable much appreciated and a key strand of our engagement with partners in the period since the Brexit referendum. But as a committed and engaged member of the European Union, we also want to share perspectives and develop common approaches on the full range of issues on the EU agenda. And this is not only a matter of pressing Irish priorities on others, but as you have said, Chairman, also of listening to friends and partners to hear and understand their concerns and perspectives. While we have always worked closely with a broad range of member states, the United Kingdom has been an important partner for Ireland on many issues in the European Union. Interestingly, this is true not just for Ireland, but for a range of like-minded countries. It has been clear to us that the loss of the UK as an EU partner would be significant, and we have undertaken a comprehensive review of our alliances and engagement within the European Union with a view to strategically strengthening and diversifying our relationships. Our approach is multifaceted, but it's important to stress that it takes place against a backdrop 
in which you're intensifying engagement with all member states. But in terms of priorities and focus, the Nordic Baltic countries, together with the Netherlands, are a key group with whom we share a common approach in areas such as EU trade policy, the single market, the further development of the Eurozone, and the ambition of the digital single market. Key strand also is deepening our relationships with larger member states and with the European institutions in order to explain Ireland's policy positions across key areas, including sensitive areas, such as the further development of the EMU, taxation, defence, migration. Strengthening contacts with key Eastern European member states is also important, particularly as we see that eastward shift in terms of the EU centre of gravity. And then the final strand of our engagement is a deeper work with a range of member states on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, whether as part of a group or bilaterally. Ireland works hard to influence the policy and legislative agenda of the EU, safeguard our interests, and to make a positive contribution towards the future direction of the Union. But let's be in no doubt this is challenging and requires sustained effort. We do this through effective engagement with the EU institutions, increased capitals to capitals engagement, both at political and official level, through our permanent representation in Brussels, which has officials from across almost all government departments there, and through mobilising our network of embassies in every capital across the European Union. And these efforts are supported by colleagues working across government at home, and they're underpinned by deep political engagement, including a sustained increase in the range and intensity of political and official level visits. In 2018, for example, and if we keep the UK separate for a moment, there were over 50 outward visits to EU member states involving the President, the Taoiseach, the Count Corla, or government ministers or ministers of state, and approximately 30 high-level visits inwards. And a key element of those outward programmes is often involves engagement with parliamentary committees like yourselves. Last month, ministers visited all 27 EU capitals as part of the government's St. Patrick's Day programme. Such visits not only offer the opportunity to celebrate our national culture and our diaspora, but also to build and deepen relationships at a political level and to raise broader awareness of Ireland's priorities through engagement with local media, parliamentary committees and think tanks. The 50 outward visits that I mentioned did not actually then include as well attendance at EU Council meetings, where ministers also regularly go to meet their colleagues in the various sectoral formations, whether it's agriculture, trade, competitiveness, foreign affairs. As the Thonishta has said, taking part in the formal discussions and decisions at these ministerial meetings is essential. But these are also an opportunity to build strong relationships with new and established colleagues, both individually and as part of wider groups. Before the March European Council, for example, the Taoiseach, together with Prime Minister Rutte uh, of the Netherlands, participated in a Nordic Baltic group meeting. The Minister for Finance now meets regularly with Nordic Baltic and Dutch colleagues before each ECOFIN Council, and the Tonishta has hosted the same grouping of ministers in advance of the Foreign Affairs Council. The more Ireland engages with other member states on key European issues, the more we enhance our capacity to shape and influence the future. We therefore actively participate with a range of partners through a number of like-minded groups linked to particular issues. And Ambassador Hackett will speak more about this during his presentation. Ireland is already, by some way, the smallest country with an embassy in every e other EU member state. And this is an invaluable asset in fostering support for our concerns in the Brexit negotiations and in advancing our interests on key issues on the EU agenda. Since the referendum in the UK, we have added senior officials to our embassy teams in the permanent representation in Berlin, Paris and London. This year, we are increasing our diplomatic representation in Madrid, Warsaw and Rome, 
and reinforcing a number of other embassies, notably our single diplomat missions. Last year, the Tónishta published a comprehensive review of Ireland's relationship with Germany. This, has included, this included 23 recommendations for widening and deepening our footprint with Germany. And we are working on implementing these, including the opening of a new consulate in Frankfurt later this year. The Tónishta has similarly requested a review of our relations with France, with whom we already share vibrant links, and we are also doing a piece of work on our relationship with the Nordic countries. Building our relations with the European institutions to ensure our Irish positions are understood and taken into account is critical. As the committee will be aware, the Taoiseach was the first speaker in the European Parliament series of debates with heads of state or government on the future of Europe. In a multilingual address, he set out Ireland's positive vision for the future of the European Union. In terms of engagement with the European Commission, this takes place at every level, ministers engaging with commissioners and officials either from the representation or from the full range of government departments meeting with their counterparts in different EU DGs. We have also developed a programme of ministerial engagement at plenary sessions of the Parliament. Irish officials working at all levels with the EU's, within the EU's institutions have also made an invaluable contribution and are an important link between the institutions and Ireland. However, in recent years, the number of Irish staff working in the institutions has been declining, largely due to retirements. And the government has made it a priority to address this demographic cliff, including through the EU jobs campaign. Over the past month, for example, Minister McEntee has addressed students in Trinity, in NUIG, in Maynooth, UCD, and to encourage them to consider a career in the EU and help put, them, put us at the forefront of shaping developments that affect the daily lives of citizens across the Union. Our high-level objectives are to increase the number of Irish candidates applying for and being successful in these competitions. And we also work right across government to ensure a range of officials are seconded into the EU institutions from government departments. Deepening our alliances to further strengthen the European Union is exciting work, but it is also challenging for a small member state like Ireland. It requires a whole of government approach with all ministers and officials across government departments actively engaging with their counterparts around Europe. The Oireachtas too has a crucial part to play in building this network. And I'd like to compliment you, Chair, and this committee on your openness to engaging with the ambassadors here based in Dublin from all the EU member states and also in hosting meetings with visiting parliamentary committees. This is a critical part of how we build these alliances. Visits and meetings by the Kian Corla, by the interparliamentary friendship groups and as I said in particular by this committee all play a role in deepening and strengthening our engagement with other member states and I'd be very interested in hearing your reflections as well on how, you can, how this can be further developed. So, Mr Chairman, many thanks uh, for, for the time, and I would now like to hand over to Ambassador Hackett to share his Brussels perspective. Thank you, Director. Ambassador? Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, Mr Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity given to us to meet with you today. It's a uh, it's an honour and a privilege for me to, to have this opportunity and thank you also for your strong interest in exploring Ireland's alliance building within the EU um, and particularly uh, in a post-Brexit context. Um, Director General O'Donoghue has outlined the government's strategic approach and the strong leadership provided in this area by the Taoiseach, Tánaiste uh, and ministers. And I obviously echo those remarks and also the remarks on the positive role played by the Oireachtas and this committee in deepening our engagement across the Union. So I hope to uh, complement her presentation with some practical perspectives uh, from my role in Brussels. I have a straightforward message. Um, Ireland's success in Europe will depend on remaining highly connected and engaged both in Brussels uh, and across each of the other 26 remaining member states. In my role as permanent representative at the Corporate One Committee, 
Uh, the team and I cover a wide range of sectoral issues, and these include the single market and competitiveness, transport, climate, agriculture and fisheries, energy, social and employment, the digital economy, research, health, education, culture and sport. So a wide area. Um, and coherence and effectiveness abroad depends on coherence and joined up thinking at home. So it is a particular uh, privilege for me to have the opportunity to work with colleagues from every government department, be they based at the permanent representation in Brussels or at home. There is very considerable uh, legislative activity on my side of the House, on the corporate one side, and crucially, almost all this legislation that comes to the committee is prepared for the Council of Ministers and agreed through qualified majority voting, or QMV. Now, as you all know, decisions taken under QMV require the support of at least 55% of the member states, representing 65% of the EU's population. And in order to get a blocking minority, that requires over 35% of the population and at least four member states. So given this maths, Ireland cannot achieve good outcomes in the legislative process without a sustained, proactive approach to building both strategic and tactical alliances as files progress. Now, we are not unique in this at all. Alliance building is an essential requirement for all member states operating within the EU particularly when operating under QMV. Even well-established geographic alliances such as the Benelux, the Visegrad and the Nordic Baltic can be fluid. They can often evolve and shift as a particular legislative file progresses. These groups do, of course, provide important political coherence for their members, but the component member states are not obliged to share the same position on legislation and regularly take different positions on different files. Now, as Director General O'Donoghue has stated, Ireland has consistently engaged in a wide range of issue-based alliances. This practice has served us well, I believe, and we are usually satisfied with the outcomes and reassurances achieved in negotiations. Indeed, we have only voted against legislative proposals at final stage on two occasions since January 2017. However, while it may be relatively rare for most member states to oppose a file at final stage, QMV considerations are always to the front, forefront of the tactics of the rotating presidency, of the Commission and of member states. They are always there in the background when we're making calculations as to how likely it is amendments will be accepted or not. Small member states are under constant pressure to demonstrate that they have broad support for their particular concerns. A presidency is most unlikely to take on board, for instance, an Irish amendment or proposal unless we can secure good backing in the room and ideally little opposition. So building and maintaining the support of as many member states as possible is an ongoing core activity for myself and all of the attaches based at the permanent representation. Mr Chairman, there are a number of recent examples which I think demonstrate the advantage and necessity of issue-based alliances. For instance, Ireland has been a leader within a group of like-minded states who support the deepening and strengthening of the single market and the digital sing single market. There is strong crossover in both groups, um, both like-minded groups with the Nordic Baltics, ourselves, the Netherlands and the Czech Republic. Indeed, in 2018, Ireland, along with Finland, the Czech Republic and Denmark, focused attention on the remaining obstacles to completing the single market in services through the Copenhagen Economic Study, which was commissioned by the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation and launched by Minister Humphreys in Brussels. And this core group of member states was successfully expanded in advance of the March European Council when 17 heads of state and government, including the Taoiseach, agreed a joint position on current priorities in this area. On the ECOFIN side, our main focus has been on the Nordic Baltic Plus, colloquially known as the New Hanseatic League. And this group was established in 2017. It's been meeting almost monthly at finance minister level, and the countries, just to put them on the record, is Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ireland, and the Netherlands. From time to time, finance ministers from Germany, France, Czech Republic, or Slovakia have attended and engaged in discussion at ministerial level meetings. And the core group has, for instance, published joint position papers 
on the future of economic and monetary union, on the capital markets union, and strengthening the role of the European stability mechanism. And as Director General Dunner has mentioned, the Nordic Baltic Ireland Netherlands formation has also met twice at heads of state and government level. Uh, during the divisive negotiations over the last couple of years on the reform of the EU's mobility, posted workers and haulage sector rules, Ireland was aligned with a number of central and eastern member states, including Hungary, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria and Slovakia, as well as those member states who face similar challenges to us in this area on the geographic periphery, such as Finland and Portugal. On the key climate files on CO2 emissions from cars, vans and heavy-duty vehicles, Ireland formed an alliance in 2018 with a number of ambitious member states and those like ourselves who are technology takers in this important area. Countries such as Luxembourg, Denmark and the Netherlands. And on agriculture, as this committee would be very aware, and the ongoing negotiations on the reform of CAP, we have worked closely with France and those seeking to ensure a fully funded common agricultural policy. Member states such as Portugal, Spain, Greece and Finland. There are many other examples that could be provided, but these, I think, indicate the considerable number of issue-based alliances where we are active and where we need to be active, and the wide range of member states involved. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that we have cooperated with every single member state uh, over the last period. The UK, as we've heard and are well aware, has been an important partner in Brussels for us on many issues. Their departure will deprive Ireland and several like-minded groups including some of those I've mentioned, of considerable political and voting strength. This will be particularly true on single market and digital economy matters. And the numbers uh, make this clear. So at present, Ireland's percentage of the EU population for qualified majority voting purposes is 0.95%. And this will increase to 1.08% after the UK leaves. The total population uh, of the Baltics, Nordics, Ireland and the Netherlands for voting purposes will amount to 11.06%. This is far short of the number required for even a blocking minority. By comparison, France and Germany will see their combined voting strength rise to 33.54%, up from just over 29%. Now, this change matters because the Presidency, the Commission and the Member States are heavily influenced, as I said earlier, by the likely voting strengths as files evolve. So becoming strongly linked with a grouping like the Nordic Baltics is very important in building our political influence. But given the numbers, we, this must be augmented by a deep level of engagement with other member states, indeed all member states, including the larger ones. Director General Dunahu has outlined the steps that we have already taken and are already continuing to do so. Mr Chairman, a number of conclusions I believe can be drawn from this experience. First, the need to regard engagement, engagement as a shared responsibility and opportunity. It's true, while the government has primary responsibility for managing relations with other member states and the EU institutions, the challenge of expanding our connections and level of engagement across Europe um, should be viewed as a collective one. The Oireachtas, civil society, our business and farming communities, youth, education and culture, cultural sectors all have a vital role to play in a national effort to deepen Irish engagement both in Brussels and across the member states. This includes understanding the issues that are important to each member state, what local political factors are at play, and the nature of relations that they have with non-EU or third countries. The support we have received from all member states on Brexit is a graphic demonstration of the benefits of such sustained engagement. Second, we can change domestic perceptions about our influence in Brussels. At times in the past, perhaps due to our size and geographic location, the EU was sometimes regarded as a phenomenon that tended to happen to us rather than an organisation that we could actively lead and shape. However, we bring a pragmatic, a problem-solving approach to issues that is very much recognised and appreciated by other member states. The Taoiseach outlined an ambitious vision for our role in Europe during his address to the European Parliament. We can and do act as a bridge between some of the ideological and geographic fault lines. Embracing this role will help increase our influence and effectiveness in the post-Brexit Union. And the new strategic agenda and incoming Commission and Parliament present an ideal opportunity to do so. 
Third, we can be clear on our EU legislative priorities and take a lead role in establishing like-minded groups on these files. Given the reality of QMV post-Brexit, we must continue our efforts to build support with the larger member states and with the key players in the European Parliament on these priorities. And fourth, as Catherine Day recently advised this committee, that our engagement with the Commission, Parliament and other EU institutions should be strengthened. This is undoubtedly true. They should not be places we visit only when we have a problem, but instead there must be ongoing engagement to shape and influence policies and legislative proposals before they are published. The programme of ministerial visits to the European Parliament has been an important additional element in this regard. I would stress that early anticipation is vital, and again, this is not a task to be left to government alone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. I look forward to hearing uh, your views and questions. Thank you. Thank you, you Ambassador uh, and both speakers. Could I ju just explain so that you know, please don't think anybody is leaving. Um, a vote has been called, so we've just lost uh, two senators, but they will try to come back once. Sometimes then there's a double vote, so just so that you're aware it's not bad manners or anything. It's just sometimes uh, inside here there's a lot of people trying to be in two and three places at the same time. Um, so now I'm going... Uh, sorry? No, you're on time. Yeah, you're on time. Um, now, uh, so sorry, could I go first of all to Deputy Hawhey, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, could I, I thank uh, both speakers, the Director General and the Ambassador, for being so forthcoming uh, with us uh, in, in outlining our, our strategy and for giving us very uh, practical assistance in what we should do you know, to help in the, in the, in the national interest. Um, there's a post-European Council statements in the Dáil Chamber at a quarter to four, so I, I may have to go to that. Uh, 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 and again, uh, no, no disrespect. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, uh, again, to, 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 to thank you for the work that you're doing. Our, our diplomats, uh, they do serve us well. Um, uh, I think Ireland, uh, as a nation state, we punch above our weight. Um, now, we, we shouldn't take anything for granted, and we do need to, to work uh, at all the issues that, that, you, ha that you have outlined. Uh, the UK leaving uh, the EU is, is a big setback for the EU and for Ireland in particular. We have lost uh, an ally on, on a number of issues, uh, but that's the challenge. Uh, and uh, you know, we do want to be at the heart of Europe, uh, and this is, uh, this is the work that we must now undertake. Could I just ask uh, two questions? I, you know, I hope they're not too political for you. You can answer them in, in, a, in an academic way if you wish. Uh, two major uh, fault lines I, I, that I would see in relation to the, the European uh, Union. Uh, number one, the, the threat to liberal democratic values, uh, particularly in, in Hungary and, and Poland. Uh, uh, is, that, is that a big uh, a threat? Uh, to the European Union, and is that going to be a fault line with people taking sides uh, on that? And of course, that's linked to the whole issue of, 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 of uh, migration uh, and the rise of populism. Uh, and you know, we, we, we have, I think there's some apprehension in, in relation to the, the forthcoming uh, European Parliament elections to see how that uh, might manifest itself. So that's one question: is, is that going to be a major fault line? And, and secondly, um, there are reports that the French President Macron. Um, was uh, particularly difficult at the recent European Council uh, meeting in, in a call to discuss uh, an extension to Brexit and that he, he was not in favour of, of, of a long extension and that, that he, held, he held out uh, on, on that particular issue. So obviously he's put forward his, his vision for the European Union uh, and that's to be welcomed that somebody is putting forward uh, their vision uh, as we discuss the future of Europe I, 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 in a formal way. But he is calling for you know, greater integration for, you know, a Eurozone budget, for closer defence cooperation, for tax harmonisation and so forth. Uh, some of these issues would pose a, a challenge to Ireland. So is that going to be a major fault line as well, the people who want much closer integration, or the nation states that want much closer integration, uh, you know, particularly, as I say, in relation to tax harmonisation and defence and so on. So I'd just be interested in, in your views on, on, on both t those uh, potential uh, problems. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, Deputy Dorkin. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Like the previous speaker, I want to uh, uh, thank our guests for coming before us uh, this afternoon and for their very interesting presentation. And I want to compliment them also on their success over the past couple of years, particularly in relation to Brexit and the degree to which uh, they have deployed themselves right throughout the European Union, throughout all the Member States, and have obviously managed successfully to transmit a message 
of the importance of Brexit, the threat it presented to us, and the threat it presents to the European Union, not only to Ireland, but to the entire European Union. I think you've done a tremendous job, and we owe each and every one of you a debt of gratitude, and I think you deserve to take a bow uh, in, in, in respect of that. I think that uh, Brexit, yes, it presents uh, a huge challenge, but it also presents opportunities. And I am well aware that uh, our diplomatic service are availing of those opportunities, every opportunity, to uh, establish, to identify and establish the grounds within which we, as a smaller nation, can continue to prosper within the European Union, not alone, but alongside other similar and like-minded uh, countries. I think this is uh, a new thing, uh, new in terms of uh, we always knew and recognised that within the European Union, each of the member states had an opportunity to align themselves with each other, not for destructive purposes, but for the purpose of promoting, again, the um, EU concept, the EU project, and maximising the benefit for each of the member states. I think that continues. I think it's a good thing. I think that our, our, our diplomatic service have done exceptional work in that area, and I think, you're, again, to be, to be congratulated. I think uh, the, the question of tax harmonisation raises its, its, its ugly head uh, on, on a fairly regular basis. And I think we need to set out a couple of uh, parameters in respect of that. Uh, the suggestion that we have somehow achieved a preferential system within the European Union uh, to the exclusion of all others is incorrect and should be rebutted as such at every possible opportunity. And of course there will be people who will seek to uh, promote the, the, the suggestion uh, that that is not so. The fact of the matter is that our 12.5% corporation profits tax applies to every cent, every euro earned in this jurisdiction. There is a serious difficulty if it has been expected that we should become uh, tax collectors for other countries either within the European Union or outside the European Union. And I would like to hear the opinions of those people who are experts in that particular area. But I cannot see, for instance, uh, uh, other European countries or non-European countries wishing to become tax collectors for an respect of profits earned in each other's territory. Nor should that be the case. I think that um, uh, we have enough obstacles to circumnavigate at the present time without taking upon uh, ourselves issues that have a possible destructive uh, element. Uh, I think this is something else we need to learn. We are not at the centre of the European wheel at the moment. And because we're not at the centre, it presents us, the emerging situation presents us with a number of challenges, and as I said, possibly a number of opportunities, but that remains to be seen. But the, the fact of the matter is this, that in the, on the mainland of Europe, it is possible to drive around the continent of Europe. It is possible to deliver goods around the continent of Europe. It is possible to receive goods from all the co four corners of, of the European Union. It is possible to trade uh, in, within the single market without ever having to get out of the truck or, the, or, the, or the, the aircraft or whatever. It's possible to travel around. That's a huge benefit in terms of exporting countries. It is a huge benefit to those of us within the European Union who depend on trade, trade with our neighbours and trade with, 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 with other non-European countries. So I hope that that is going to be borne in mind in the course of any discussions that take place. And I have no difficulty in having discussions about, about uh, uh, um, uh, um, potential levelling of the playing field where that is required. But it shouldn't be done on the basis of false information, nor should it be done on the basis that in some way uh, we have been negligent in the past in, uh, in enforcing uh, the rules as so far as they apply. We have already dealt with the double Irish and the various other issues that have, that have come up over the past number of years. And we also had to deal with a very serious economic challenge uh, following the economic crash. And we did so with the help of our colleagues within the European Union. And uh, no uh, thanks at all to those who would seek to exploit the situation for their various benefits. And I think we should keep that in mind in the future. I would also say that, again, and this may not be as commonly known, that we are part of the single market. That single market should apply in Dublin, in, in, in Kildare, in, in Cork, 
in Kerry, in Donegal, in, in Monaghan, and every part of this country, the same as it applies right at the centre of Europe, what, in whatever area. And the concept of that is accepted. However, for instance, in the area of medicines in this country, we have never really got the benefit of the single market because we seem to pay a premium. Uh, why that should be, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is that we are still within the European Union, we are still within the single market, and it might not always be known that some member states redistribute goods to this country. Uh, it doesn't come free, but we are entitled to the same price uh, uh, benefits as other European countries, large and small, throughout the European Union, in respect of all of the goods that we receive all the services we receive and all the goods and services that we deliver. And despite what some people might think, this is not all one-way traffic. Uh, we sell and we trade well and above beyond our, our size and weight with most other countries. Remember, we are the UK's fifth largest trader. Trade to a greater extent with the UK than they trade with India and China together. Uh, we have uh, in the past shown that we are at the head of the posse when it comes to taking risks, when it comes to taking on challenges, and instead of, of, of suggestions in some quarters that you know we're recalcitrant in some way, we are not. Last point I want to make, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry for going on so long, is this. In the modern Europe there are many challenges, some of them discordant, and some who seek to exploit the benefits of swings to the hard right or to the hard left. History, the history of Europe should remind us, <clears throat> if we want to revisit that, we can do so at any time. It is readily available. The cost is huge. And for those who suggest, not at all, that can never happen again. Those things will never happen again. Wrong. They have happened before. More than once. More than twice. Many, many times. And if they have, they have shown again and again the inability of current generations to recognise the, 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 the mistakes made by previous generations and to more particularly and especially recognise the cost to their own nation and to their own people. I, I, would, I would say that if, if I were to select an issue <clears throat> that I think we need to look at carefully in the modern Europe, it is this. We had the Balkan Wars in the last 20 years when we saw thousands of people fleeing from whatever they were fleeing from. It wasn't from wealth, health or happiness, and they fled. And thankfully, nobody put up barriers to stop them. Nobody uh, impeded them. Nobody suggested they should stay at home. Nobody built walls. And God knows we have enough experience in Europe with wall building in the past as well. Nobody put up razor wire to impede them. And the reason was we understood that they had a reason for going the way they went. No good challenging people and saying, well, you know, you're a threat to us. Everybody's a threat to everybody, if that be the case. And I think that it's important that we recognise that, that there's more to be gained from cohesiveness, from, 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 from united approach, and not suggesting for a moment that we should have uh, an open door in respect of immigration, whatever the case may be, but we do have responsibilities. The civilised world has responsibilities, and if the civilised world doesn't accept and recognise those responsibilities, then civilization will pay a high cost. So, Chairman, I'm sorry for, for going on so long. Uh, my favourite subject, I'm afraid to say, but uh, I thank our guests once again. I wish you well in the work that you have undertaken, and you still have to undertake. And I compliment those who are engaged in supporting that work, and our colleagues <clears throat> throughout the European Union the 27 member states who stood solidly together with us in the course of the last two years when it was not always uh, popular to do so. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Deputy. Now, at the, the last Joint Committee's last engagement was uh, with Catherine Day, who spoke very well on the issue of Ireland's alliance building and um, g gave the Joint Committee a lot of food for thought at that time. She suggested that Ireland uh, needs to do more to understand the positions of other member states and offer more support to other member states on issues that are not necessarily important to us. Uh, do you think that there are policy issues which either Ireland or their Octus have not traditionally engaged with or that we should do more on? That would be one question. And also, the Joint Committee is interested in how alliances can be built, uh, not just at ministerial and government level, but also at parliamentary and civic society level. 
The Houses have been acted, active in this area. Are there areas where additional parliamentary input could be beneficial, in your opinion? Uh, thirdly, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has also prioritised trade and business links in its global Ireland strategy, proposing expansion of our agencies abroad, such as Enterprise Ireland, the IDA and Board BA, all of who, of course, do, do great work. Uh, do you think there are any other existing networks we can utilise to build bilateral uh, relations? And, um, and finally, could I just say that when you are in Brussels or travelling with ministers, uh, are there things about Ireland that you feel are not always understood that we should try to explain better? In other words, showcasing and selling ourselves uh, and highlighting all the positive attributes of Ireland, our society, our business acumen, our exports, the, the intelligent young workforce that we have to offer, uh, the fact that, uh, in my own humble opinion, I believe we're away better than anybody else around the, the rest of the world and around the rest of Europe. But it's selling that and selling all the positive aspects of Ireland. Are we doing enough? Do you find in your particular roles that there are ways uh, that we fall down? Because the only way we can get better and better is by putting up and up the bar at all times and trying to push ourselves further, be that as parliamentarians or, again, at ministerial level or at government level. Because while we can have all the debates that we want to have politically when we're here. I really am of the belief, and uh, people from all political parties and none would know I would be very much this way. It's like at the moment, while all of the uh, Brexit negotiations and talks are going on, I believe that every person that's inside in the houses of their octus, and it's not that we all have to be blindly uh, you know, supportive of, 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 of what the government is saying or anything on the issue, but I really believe that it is not a time for us to be critical of ourselves or, or of the work that's being done. I really believe that it's a time to row in and sort of say, yes, we're all in this together, we're all working to achieve the best deal we can for Ireland and to ensure that with the peace process, our trade, uh, our international reputation, that we'll be, that we'll come out the best way we can out of this. And politically, as serious and sensible politicians, we have to, to row in. And like I've always complimented uh, and would continue to do so, uh, the Taoiseach, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, our junior minister, all of these people and all of the officials, remember, because uh, a lot of, in a lot of the cases, the politicians are OK to the forefront. They're the people who are seen in the, on the 9 o'clock news and on the world stage. But there is excellent work being done by, by um, permanent representatives in the different departments who are, are really trying to get us prepared for whatever eventuality we have to face. So again, I, I, I'm looking at us in, um, in a critically positive way of, is there things that you think we should be doing that we're not doing? Because if there is, I'd like to hear about it, and I'm sure my colleagues would also like to hear about it too. So could I hand the floor back to yourselves and, and uh, treat this in whatever casual way you want to mix in between yourselves, what, whatever suits yourselves in an informal way, whatever way you like. Great. Thank you very much, Chairman, and exactly we will kind of between us, I, I hopefully address the, the various points that have been made. And, and can I just say, first of all, uh, that you know I'll, I'll certainly be delighted to pass on the positive words that you've all said about the work of the diplomatic service, uh, particularly on Brexit, but not just on Brexit. It, it genuinely is a huge whole of government effort and, and across all parties as well. Uh, but, but I'll certainly pass on those words. And if I may also, as one of the officials involved in the Brexit omnibus bill, express again from our side um, you know, the, the appreciation that there is of the huge uh, cross-party effort there was in the Oireachtas to, to get that bill through in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, and hopefully, as the Thonish says, it can continue to sit on its shelf, um, we hope. Um, maybe just turning to the questions, um, and in, in, they were a little political, Deputy Hoy, but um, I'll, I'll try maybe. And certainly both you and obviously Deputy Durkin talked a bit about the, the rise of, of the, you know, the rise of populism on either the hard right or the hard left. Uh, and obviously it's something, and, and the Thonish has spoken about this, so I, I very much draw from him. Uh, it is something that is both a concern 
you know, for all member states uh, in different degrees, obviously, but it's something that we see in, in, in all member states. Um, I some, you know, we, we shouldn't be too um, pessimistic, I think, because there also are, you know, positive trends that we can look at. Um, I was very struck by the election of the first woman uh, president or prime minister in Slovakia uh, just, just recently from a very strong, open, liberal agenda. So, you know, it, it moves in both directions, but I think we do, I mean, part of what we need to do at the EU level, because the EU is often a target for some of this, is to be, um, is to be very close to our citizens in terms of explaining what it is that the EU is and what it is it does and deliver. Um, and I think that the citizens' dialogue that was led by Minister McEntee last year was very important. But so too is the Oireachtas in this and, and the role of this committee in particular. But voices um, articulating clearly what it is the EU can and does achieve, um, I think, are hugely important in this. Um, and, and, you know, the EU is complicated uh, and, and we can't, you know, one of the challenges, I think, around populism is this tack to, to very simple messages and it's not, you know, it's harder to talk about the complicated things but we need to do that and we need to give strong support uh, to the EU in that sense uh, and, and all voices need to be, you know, need to be around that. So I think there's that uh, is important for us and obviously, I mean, some of the issues arise from, you know, mistaken or misunderstood perceptions. Some have validity around the, you know, the differing impacts of globalization on different parts of the community, on different economic sectors, and these need to be addressed as well, both at the EU and the national level. Um, Deputy Hoy, you also mentioned particular countries, um, Hungary and Poland, and as you probably know, uh, they, are, um, the, they are involved now in what we call the Article 7 procedure at the EU level, which is a rule of law procedure. Uh, so we, um, in, in terms of uh, both a Commission and Parliament-led uh, views on, on issues relating to the rule of law in both those countries. So there have been extensive discussions at the General Affairs Council on those issues in which we and Minister McEntee participate actively, uh, stressing very much the importance of the rule of law uh, and, and the centre that that gives us in terms of managing uh, our affairs both domestically and at EU level. So I think that process will continue. There's also efforts around perhaps finding um, other pathways to address this. So, for example, the Belgians and German uh, government have proposed a, a, an out, a, a different, more informal peer review process. So I think the important thing is to continue to engage, and that's what we're very much doing, including formally at the General Affairs Council. Um, and then in terms of uh, the, the, that, that kind of more integration, less integration, uh, tension that you mentioned, and, and you know, I think that has always been part of what the EU is about, is the pace at which it moves uh, and how we move forward together. Uh, and I think what is critically important always is that the direction of travel be a shared direction of travel. I, I think from our point of view, some of, of you mentioned uh, President Macron in particular, um, you know, some of his vision would go further than we would currently um, be. But I think it comes back very much in our case to what uh, Ambassador Hackett was saying, you know, that we are a pragmatic member state. So where it makes sense to work together, where it makes sense to work together at EU level, we will want to do that uh, while protecting certain core uh, national interests and certain core areas of national responsibility, such as taxation, as mentioned by Deputy Durkin. Um, and then I think, Chairman, just if I may, and then I'm going to ask, Joe will, will come in on a few things. Um, in terms of um, your very clear questions, uh, some of which I think we need to go away and think about a bit more, uh, I, I do think that Catherine Day point about not just engaging on our issues, but more broadly is very important. And it's again a bit like what Joe was saying about not just going to the Commission when you have a problem, but that you're part of the positive agendas. And that we do quite a bit of already in areas like the single market and the digital single market, where we would be very much part of the creators of the positive agenda. But it is the case, this is not just about finding like-minded groups and working with them. This is also about deepening our understanding um, of the, pers the, the perspectives of other member states. And that's why you know, the issue-based work that goes on in Brussels is hugely important in terms of the legislative proposals but I have seen 
particularly through accompanying the Thornish and Minister McEntee uh, on visits right around Europe, that, a cap you know, that engagement by a minister in another country gives you a depth of understanding that you don't otherwise get and is hugely important. And we're also trying to do that at official level with a lot more kind of EU uh, dialogue at official level with key countries as well. Um, and in terms of, of what the Iraqis and Parliament might do, and again, I think I'm sure you have um, far better insights on that than I have, but, but clearly that, that parliamentary strand is hugely important because it brings you beyond government into the whole range of political opinion in any given country, which I think is very important and ties back into the first point. And so I, I think, you know, parliamentary visits outward and inward are, ver are very important around key agendas. And particularly when you think of, you know, some of the parliaments would have very strong roles vis-a-vis -vis EU issues. So, for example, and then also in terms of our strategic interests with some of the priorities we've outlined, for example, with the Nordic Baltic countries, to, to, map, to map a parliamentary engagement on top of uh, complementary to an um, to a government to government engagement, I think, would be very valuable. Um, so maybe, Joe, and I can come back if there's anything else. Sorry. Ambassador, could I oh, call absolutely. in just a few of our other speakers? Senator Neil Richmond, if, if, yeah. if that's okay. Thank you, Chairman. And apologies again that we had to dash off the trickiness of votes. Um, I suppose there's a few areas, and I apologies if apologise if colleagues have covered them, and some of them touched on both your remarks. Um, I suppose the first Director General only was in relation to the interparliamentary aspect of building new alliances. Um, that's something I wonder, can we do more? If we look at, you know, before the abolition of, <clears throat> of the dual mandate and, the, and even going back further to the introduction of direct elections to the European Parliament, one of the great strengths was it was domestic parliamentarians engaging with other domestic parliamentarians, but on a European level, about European issues. The main uh, outlet for this at the moment is through the regular COSAC meetings that some of us attend, uh, and indeed the COSAC chairperson's meeting. But is there, I just wonder, is there a way to maybe increase that across the sectoral basis, whereby it's not just a biannual COSAC meeting, but it's something that reflects, be it uh, agriculture issues prior to the Agriculture Council or something like that, to really nail that down. Now, I appreciate that requires a level of commitment and indeed investment from member state national parliaments. But being able to talk, MEPs are great, but they have a very distinct role in the European Parliament and to some extent they leave their domestic constituencies behind. But being able to have member state parliamentarians engaging with others, but about European issues or about issues on a European level, I think would um, increase awareness, first of all, of the debate, but also increase the importance of this debate on a domestic level. Um, I listened with interest, obviously, in relation to the EU jobs aspect, and I, I didn't disagree with anything. But there was two things I wanted to pick up on. One I raised with um, Catherine Day at our last meeting, and she wasn't exactly too receptive to it, was looking at, we have our derogation for Irish, and that's being rolled out to an extent. Um, but post-Brexit, when the UK leave, we're left with Ireland and Malta as the only English-speaking countries, although neither of us use English on an EU level as our first language? And how can we ensure that English is essentially the working language of the EU ever since 2004, we can accept, but how can we assure, ensure that English is given that level of importance? And indeed, how could Ireland maximise that? And I suppose with the EU jobs, um, the EU jobs campaign going around third level institutions here, and indeed the work with the Council of Europe and the work the King's Inn do with lawyer linguists is brilliant. But I feel that there is a certain pop population, and Ambassador Hackett, you might have a more contemporary view of this is a certain population in Brussels of Irish people working, be it in, in the private sector or in trade associations or in not-for-profits or indeed in political roles, who aren't turning down work in the Commission or the other institutions. It's not because of money, because of circumstance, because of, I suppose, interest in the work. It's just they're intimidated by the application procedure. And how can we identify and work with people who have already committed to life in Brussels, Luxembourg, Strasbourg, or wherever it may be, and say, well, perhaps now you've been here half a dozen years working for a trade association in the private sector, it actually probably would be a lot more rewarding in, on many levels to be in the Commission or the Council or the Parliament and the Secretariat. How do we target that audience? Because um, I think it's one that 
if, it's, if it isn't being neglected, I stand corrected, but I just think a lot of people are in that space. And when I went over to do my stage, and the people who've stayed on, very few of them are in the Commission, or the Council, or the Parliament. They're in non-institutional roles, but they're still in Brussels, and they maybe have married people from other member states, and they've committed their lives there, but how do we get them to buy in? Um, I suppose in the, in the wider um, diplomatic outreach, kind of moving toward, well, well, first of all, I'll stay actually with the sort of the EU specific institutional focus, and that's in relation to the role of the perm rep in particular. I think one of the great um, shames was post presidency in 2013 when we, to an element, descaled the permanent representation. And I hope we learn that we don't do that again, that we maintain um, not just the size, but the commitment to the perm rep post Brexit, regardless of what happens. I think we, we've seen the benefit of having a very strong presence in Brussels uh, in the, from the institutional focus. And I suppose I'd question then, you've gone through a lot of the, in great detail, and so much detail that it kind of put a strike through most of the questions I was going to ask, a lot of the, a lot of the policy um, areas that are so vitally important when we talk about new alliances, um, and they're very, very true. But I suppose one area in particular is kind of bringing it together, and that's over the the overall uh, approach to the budget and the multi-annual financial framework. And I'm extremely concerned that due to ongoing delays with the Brexit negotiations and everything else, we're very, we're very behind the curve when it comes to the MFF negotiations. That we're coming at it late, that we're leaving the negotiation period uh, too short, um, be it at a parliamentary level, uh, in, the, in the European Parliament, be it a commission level, a council level. And I just have a fear that we may be trying to pass through a European budget in such a truncated time that easy and quick decisions are going to be made. How do we work with allies to make sure that we don't simply get tired at the end, that a process that maybe we would have given 18 months to, but due to circumstances we're only going to be able to give 12 months to, that it's still as thorough and as detailed in the atmosphere of competing interests of certain member states wanting to cut, cut the budget, wanting to move um, from investment to the CAP perhaps to further security and defence. How can we ensure our alliances protect that? And then moving from the wider sort of EU perspective, uh, but in the, staying in the European context, um, I'm delighted about the further um, opening of a council in Frankfurt. But I really do think we need to go beyond Frankfurt and we need to look at a, a second French city, be it Lyon or down into the south, be it Nice or Marseille. We also should be looking at Barcelona in Spain and Milan in, in, in Italy, amongst others. And we're looking at the commercial centres as well as just the administrative centres. And I think that's where we have a real opportunity. And it's very, very difficult for politicians to justify the time spending on diplomacy and spending on our reach abroad. Um, a lot of great work has been shown about the value of having a very strong diplomatic corps, particularly in the last two or three years. But how do we say what's the return on investment for an extent? That yes, we're investing in consuls in Irish houses, we're bringing Enterprise Ireland, the other state agencies, Board BIA, the IDA, and these are not just serving the Irish population abroad or handling intergovernmental queries, but they are bringing serious investment to Ireland and to Irish people. And I know they are, but I think when we look at the commercial centres around Europe, that's as important uh, as everything else. And that brings me to our final point within the United Kingdom. I very much welcome uh, the reopening of the Consul in Cardiff, but the aim to open another Consul in the UK, is, the ch is, is it easy to identify that that should be in the Northern Powerhouse region, it should be Manchester, or is there moving away from the economic sense I suppose, a, a diaspora consular approach to the Midlands, be it Birmingham or Coventry. And I appreciate your opinions on that. Thank you very much, Chairman. Senator Crockwell. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, I'm involved in legislation that's going on in the Senate at the moment, and so I'm not going to take a lot of your time, but I wanted to take the opportunity while you were here to thank you for your service, for what you have done for this country uh, in, in Brussels and abroad. Uh, it hasn't gone unnoticed, the amount of work that has been put in by our people on the ground throughout Europe and the effort that has been made to keep Ireland's, uh, I suppose, needs out in front. And um, it, it really is amazing how a small little country like ours can have such an impact. And I really believe that the staff working at all levels uh, need to be 
assured of our gratitude for the work that's been done. Just one very quick question, and I won't be here to hear the answer, but I will follow up on it, and that is, um, as we lose the UK, alliances are going to become extremely important. And it strikes me that alliances are going to be mixed. For example, in, one, in, one, in the area of agriculture, for example, we might be looking towards France. In the area of finance, we might be looking towards Germany. Have we assessed each one of the member states to see where the strengths or where the commonality exists? And um, have, have we, if you want, got a checkerboard now that if an issue comes up, we can say we need to talk to A, B, C, D and D on that particular issue uh, and, you know, move, move across the alliances as we need them. I'm sure that the work has been done, but I'd just like to hear your perspective on it. And sadly, I'm going to have to read it. So thank you very much for your attendance here today. And please forgive the way we just bob in and out. I know it has been discussed recently on the media that people pop in, ask a question and leave. But the nature of the job has us doing that. So sorry. Thank you. S S Senator Leighton, are you able to... I'm fine. Well, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. And could I, just before we start, could I welcome the Portuguese delegation and to thank you very much for being here today. I, I hope that you are having a very enjoyable stay. I know you've had, had a busy itinerary so far, but you are very, very welcome here. And we want to thank you for taking time to be here. judicial appointment bill and we just prevented a guillotine in the shannon so that's work is done so they can proceed now in casual pace regarding the rest of the bill so first of all i'd like to welcome uh, director general donahue and your colleagues ambassador joe hackett and indeed i'd like to welcome our portuguese delegation to the, here to the committee and indeed all the representatives of embassies here in dublin it's a great turnout here and all it is that our European Affairs Joint Committee because there's a great solidarity between us all uh, in relation to the work in Europe. Uh, again, I'd, I'd like to share the compliments to the work of, of our permanent representatives in, in Brussels. Uh, it's quite some time ago, but I was the de de designated minister in relation to the Single European Act. And uh, I got enormous briefing there uh, on a Sunday night and we deal with every issue at the time. In fact, I had a great ally in John Redwood, who I think is defected to the Brexiteers. But we work very closely. And uh, I think it's very important to the British UK know that we, we are not, we're not happy they're leaving, basically. We, we have no choice in the matter. That's a choice for matter for themselves but at the end of the day. But at least they know we're friends. And we'll continue on the friendship in, the, uh, in Brussels. We're going to continue. They'll have a presence there, as you know. They'll have a permanent presence there in Brussels. And we will continue on that. Now, in relation to... Um, the work of the Department of Foreign Affairs and indeed I see the need for the plans for the expansion up to 2025, which I welcome very much. Because my experience, and I was delighted that Foreign Affairs, well, foreign affairs and Trade, because when I was Trade Minister, there was sometimes, not everywhere, some resistance, uh, particularly in longer serving ambassadors, that weren't really appreciative that the trade side was part of their portfolio because they felt they were kind of answerable to the president and that was their role and that they were diplomats, I suppose, as trade. But trade is essential. And I'm very much in favour of the expansion. The cost sometimes can be prohibitive, but can be also quite keen. But the point, point is, if you have an ambassador or representative in a country, you then have the ear of the government and ministers, and you have access to trade ministries, you have access to uh, business. And I know when an ambassador uh, invites people to the embassy or residence, there's a tremendous response and uh, to respect that invitation. And then with that, you have the state agencies, the IDA, and it was Ireland, and uh, B and so on and so on. But it is, it's, the, it's the gate, it's the way to open up. Now, that's a fact, because when you're invited to an embassy, and indeed we're looking forward to going to the Portuguese embassy residence this evening, that's a lovely invitation to get, I have to say, and you respect that. Uh, and that's my experience. And I've been in Japan, I've been in Islamic Republic of Iran and elsewhere. And that's the same experience in every country I've worked with with, with the Department of Trade and Marketing. But just uh, in relation to uh, alliances, I'm very anxious we would promote the, the, the expansion of Europe, uh, not the contraction of Europe. Now, I was prepared to report for the Council of Europe of Montenegro, which is online, by the way, 
where I recommended that they move forward in relation to negotiations in relation to the membership of the European Union. Now, I, there were certain aspects of there. We had brought a report out to the post-monitoring, actually, report, which is a step forward. And uh, I also said to them uh, when I was there uh, as a representative of the Council of Europe that they have some idea that they have to join NATO to kind of join the European Union. Of course, that's not true. And I said, look, you can join the European Union. We're in the European Union, but we're not in NATO. So just I know they wish to develop the NATO context, but that's their, that's their own business. So I just think Montenegro, Bosnia-Herzegovina and elsewhere, that if we can actually build up those uh, relationships with those countries and really take a focus to work with them through the diplomatic services, through your knowledge and the work that you're doing, that they will know that we will have friends, we will have friends in courts. And finally, just in relation to the embassy in the Islamic Republic of Iran, I was there in that embassy, enormous expansion. I wouldn't be too deterred by any other country having views about the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's a, it's a country that has enormous respect for Ireland, and we have enormous <coughs> relationship with the Islamic Republic of Iran. So I, I'm very anxious uh, that we see diplomatic context re-established there as quickly as possible. Again, thank you for coming here today and thank you for your excellent contribution and the work that you're doing abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator, could we go back to you now, Ambassador, for the final wrap? Um, thank you very much. Um, so just briefly to try and cover some of the um, comments and questions. Well, Angle has covered, I think, some of Deputy Hahi's questions on the rule of law fully agree with that. I mean, I think as a simple rule of thumb is uh, the EU positions itself as a world leader for the promotion of rule of law, democracy, multilateralism uh, abroad outside the Union's borders. And that objective is inevitably undermined unless we uphold those values within the European Union. So um, that is why we've adopted the position we have and that the Tonge has set out. Um, I think that Deputy Hoy mentioned French leaderships and ambitious programs. Um, the European Union and Ireland needs an ambitious France. It needs a France and a president of France uh, who has clear visions for Europe. Uh, many of those things we agree with, as the Taoiseach set out when he visited Paris. Um, and everything from ambition on climate to agriculture uh, to the promotion of democracy and rule, rule of law. Of course, there's things that we have a different approach of. Um, the Dáil tomorrow will have a debate on the strategic agenda for the European Union for the next five years. France will come to the European Council with its vision for the strategic agenda. Ireland will come with its. And the, and the member states will agree a way forward. Uh, that's the way we do business. And that's uh, something that should be uh, welcomed. Um, Deputy Durkin, I think you raised a number of issues, uh, three in particular. First of all, on taxation, um, fully agree with the views that you have set out, uh, both the reasoning uh, behind it and the fact that our long-standing position on corporate taxation in particular has been important and good for this country and recognised as such uh, by parties across the Oireachtas and by our, by our people. Um, all I can say there is that um, Ireland's position on corporate taxation is, is well known in member states and in Brussels. It is recognised that it is one of our stro strong interests. Every member state has a strong interest uh, in different issues. They advocate those as strongly as possible. Uh, successive governments have done so. We continue to do so uh, in Brussels. It's an area that's covered by unanimity. Um, but it's an area that we're not alone on. Um, and in fact, it's a good example of how new alliances have worked well. So this group, as it's called, the Hanseatic League of Nordic, Baltic, Netherlands countries, has worked quite well amongst finance ministers. And there was important political support for the position that the Minister of Finance took uh, at a recent council in relation to digital taxation. So that's an example of where alliances uh, can work well. But, but you're right, W. Durkin, it's an area that we have to continue uh, to be vigilant on. Fully agree on the single market. The single market is arguably the single uh, biggest economic achievement of the European Union. Is it complete? No, it's not complete. Ireland is one of those member states who continually advocates for the completion of the single market. It's why we've taken a leading role on services. And you're absolutely right that we face, because of our geographic positioning, mobility challenges. Uh, and we've reflected those and formed alliances to try and tackle some of those. And I suppose I agree with you strongly, most strongly of all, on the issue of Europe essentially being 
at its core a peace project and a place of welcomes for those uh, uh, peoples, wherever they come from, uh, who are fleeing uh, persecution or deprivation. Uh, I think we always have to remind younger people in particular that the EU at its core is a peace project. It's, and, and I think it's very welcome that you've, you've highlighted that there. I won't stray into the migration issue other than to say that a large number of members of the Defence Forces uh, have spent recent years as part of an Operation SOFIA and the particular remit of our contingent was search and rescue of migrants in the Mediterranean Sea. So I think um, Ireland can be proud of the role it's played there uh, in particular. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you had a number of questions that I think Angle has, has addressed. Just to say specifically, are there areas that we haven't been attentive to in the past? Um, maybe a way to come at that is to say that perhaps we collectively need to be more aware and engaged on issues of importance to other member states. Now, it's absolutely understandable. Every member state is focused on the areas of most importance to them. But there are things that strike me a lot in Brussels that other member states are very focused on, like um, the Eastern Partnership Agenda, like um, energy issues, which inevitably Ireland has a different perspective on based on our uh, geographic position. Uh, it's important that we just know what position is of member states on those and why they're important. I mean, the reform of something called the Posted Workers Directive and laws governing the haulage sector, if you went to some member states like Bulgaria, Romania, they would have that in their top three EU issues because it is so politically sensitive. We just need to know that and when we go to those countries, be able to engage on that, on that position. It's not a criticism that we haven't been able to do that up to now. It's just something that we need to uh, be aware of. Absolutely agree. What's the narrative we need to be selling about Ireland? Um, I think maybe across member states and in Brussels, they need to hear more about the importance of our indigenous SME sector. Uh, they need to hear more about the innovation taking place in our farming and, and agriculture sector, the sort of really smart things rural communities are, are doing, the creative things, um, and the way we can actually be a, a role model in other member states as to how they do this. It's not always about taxation, it's not just about foreign direct investment or multinationals. Our economic story um, is much more rich and complex than simply that, even though that's an important part and it's something that we can say. Um, Angle has touched on the sort of practical things the Oireachtas can do and, and Senator uh, Neil touched on those, or Senator um, Richmond touched on those too. Um, look, I think the more you can meet and connect with people, the better. It's a simple rule of thumb. We're good at that in Ireland. Irish people are good at it. Uh, the more, and, and you've extremely busy schedules, but the more you can go to member states and meet your counterparts as a committee, um, the better. Um, I think there's a role for us in making sure that all of the committees, wherever they go, um, focus on their area, but also that we can add value to that by having shared messages maybe about priorities for Ireland and also priorities for uh, the member states that, that you're visiting. Um, and I, I think that just to be more systematic as a country uh, in our engagement and joined up is something that we just have to, we're getting better on, but we just have to um, continue with. Some of the questions um, that Senator Layden and, uh, and Senator Richmond touched on about our, our strategic engagement and placements are more appropriate for HQ here, so I'll, I'll, I'll suggest that Angle take those. Is that okay? I'll just be very brief because I'm very conscious yeah, of the yeah. Portuguese de delegation here. Um, so no, I mean, I think um, Senator Richmond actually made a very interesting point about the target groups for uh, potential success in EU competitions. Uh, and, and that is something I think those who already have experience of, of the EU in other ways is actually a very rich target group. So I think that's one of the things as, you know, to complement the general awareness raising of opportunities in the EU is to look more clearly at what are kind of key target groups because this competition, as he said, the competition process is very elaborate, it's lengthy, it's challenging. Um, and we have already done some work on supporting people through that uh, and giving them advice both in terms of sessions done in the Perm Rep and sessions we've done here in Dublin. Uh, but again, probably scope to do more. So I think uh, it, it's, you know, it, it is, a, we recognise that there, there are, we need to constantly, I suppose, refocus on how we're getting as many people as possible into the institutions. So very interested in that thought. Um, 
what else was there on the role of the perm ref I, I noticed you didn't embrace the let's just but I mean I think you know I think the critical thing about the perm rep is both obviously the, the, the number of staff but the critical thing is that it has representatives from almost every government department I mean it is quite unlike any other EU mission or any other Irish embassy or mission really um, it's by far the largest but it is also a whole of government office um, and I think we're constantly recalibrating uh, in departments indeed you know precisely what the range of people they need there are in terms of what is key on the legislative agenda uh, but I mean Nash, clearly for a presidency you ramp up in a different way but I think what we have seen frankly again in a Brexit context is is more of an engagement and ramping up both in Brussels and, and in our other missions and um, the other point Senator Richmond made around uh, I suppose a bit of concern that uh, Brexit was so much preoccupying the agenda that um, maybe we weren't able to focus or had the capacity to focus as much as possible as much as we needed to on some other key issues notably the MFF I suppose I'd make two comments one is and it goes back to the point about when you go to other capitals I mean Brexit is not the top of the agenda in many many other capitals so in fact they are focused on the MFF and uh, very much so and, and other key issues as well so I think that in that sense the EU collectively is focused on it uh, it has taken its own rhythm there were questions around our proposals from the Commission initially or urgings from the Commission that we would agree the MFF quickly and in advance of the European Parliament elections uh, that we felt as member states collectively was too too rushed and so it is moving forward at a pace um, and I think that um, we have tried within our own system very definitely to preserve you know clear policy and capacity including my colleague Kira here uh, but uh, kind of led by Taoiseach's foreign affairs and finance a core group focused on the MFF so I think I don't know did you want to yeah um, and then in terms of the only other point maybe just was to come back on was two things maybe one was uh, Senator Richmond again on opening consulates in other uh, cities so I'll happily take that lovely list of cities that he mentioned um, back to back to the department I think though what we need to look at always is the overall Irish footprint it's not just the embassy or the consulate but it's also the agencies and what is the right mix so for example we do already have um, a number of the agencies are already based in Milan and um, Enterprise Ireland is about to open an office or has announced opening an office in Lyon in France so it's about you know when we talk about Ireland's global footprint it is the full global footprint and then maybe just finally to pick up on again if I may on the point made by a number of you around you know what role the parliamentary engagement can play and how that might be augmented I mean I, I have to say I'm, it's really encouraging to hear the openness and the positivity here from the members in terms of how you also can you know what role can be played at the parliamentary level and I think it's critical uh, and we'll be happy to, to continue that dialogue with you either directly or via your clerks and I also think the role of national parliaments um, is hugely important in terms of you know the, the the democratic legitimacy of the EU so it's both about the alliance building and engaging with other parliamentarians but also your role nationally in terms of the democratic legitimacy of the EU it's a critical complement to the role of the European Parliament so I very much welcome the, the very positive signals here today as well and as I say happy to to follow up with you thank you, thank you. Um, so while this has been didn't, uh, any... I didn't know because um, I think probably it would be better to get one of my colleagues who, who focuses on the Middle East to come back to you on that. Yeah. And in relation to the expansion, are they working with the um, Eastern, former Eastern Europe, oh, what's your Absolutely. involvement there as such? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, we, we, we would be among those member states who have a very positive uh, agenda in terms of the enlargement of the oh. European Union. So in terms of the discussions that take place in Brussels, uh, including at the General Affairs Council, we are definitely one of the positive voices around the table in support of enlargement, um, recognising, I suppose, that you know, the value that the EU membership has brought to us and to other member states and wanting to ensure, providing the necessary conditions are met, that that opportunity is there for other member states. And again, Minister McEntee, for example, has 
in her time as Minister for European Affairs, travelled twice to the region, um, including most recently actually in a joint visit with her Finnish colleague, which is an interesting example of both alliances and, and the enlargement agenda. So very much part of our thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, apologies. No, that. Uh, thank you very much. So um, could I just um, thank you both very much, Ambassador Hackett and Ms. Odunhu, and also to thank uh, Kira Delaney and uh, Claire Callahan for being here today. We appreciate your time very, very much. Uh, and again, apologies, you do understand about members coming and going. The one thing about these um, meetings and these engagements, uh, even though sometimes members aren't present, they always get to see and hear all of the questions, all of the answers and the total engagement. And uh, it always comes up for discussion afterwards. So your time is really, really appreciated. And, uh, and I thank you very, very much for being here today and taking time out to be here. It's very much appreciated. So now we will suspend just for a while to allow uh, the delegation to take your seats and we'll have an informal meeting and session. And, uh, and when we will return... We'll...